Hello, I'm Miles Barth. I'm a senior specialist of photographs at Artnet Auctions. Today is December 20th. It's just a few days before Christmas, and I'm speaking with a photographer who's had five and a half decades in the field of photography. And in fact, um, with photography before there was a real field, at least in terms of the market of photography. We're in Martins Creek, Pennsylvania, um, on a lovely farm in Martins Creek is on the eastern end of Pennsylvania and according to the 2010 census it has 631 residents and I'm with um, one of the more important if I can say that uh, residents of Martins Creek Mr. Larry Fink. Larry um, I can go through his resume and it would probably put you to sleep because it's too long and too impressive for most people to really comprehend but between his books, um, the awards he's gotten, the solo exhibitions he's been in, the group exhibitions he's been in, the lectures he's given, uh, there are very few people that I've ever really had a, the pleasure of talking with that have more experience in the field than Larry does. Um, we're going to start by just asking him a, a very quick 20 words, maybe or less, maybe more, of just what attracted him to photography. Um, born in Brooklyn, he's found himself as a, uh, a gentleman's gentleman farmer. And uh, I wish I could just show you around this place because it's as amazing as, as Larry is and his work is. Um, but let's talk about the beginnings quickly and succinctly. So the question, as stated, was what is it that drew me to photography? and, and um now looking at you, not so much as a camera, but as myself, it was persons and people like you which drew me to photography, meaning that it was curiosity about other people and about the nature of the odd magnetism that occurred between us as living, throbbing, energized beings. Now, to think that at the age of 12 or 13 when I started that I was thinking about it in those kinds of terms is to be thinking about absurdity. I was just drawn to it, period. And where did the camera come in? The tool that was the interface between you and the rest of the world, documenting that thought. Where did that come in? Was it a birthday gift? It was, was it yeah. A, um, something you saved my dad for? My was... Uh, a casual hobbyist of sorts, no darkroom in particular, but he did like to make and code pictures. And he had a Super Icon to be in a Roloflex. And he, since I was a bad kid in the business of getting in trouble whenever I could, he figured, well, maybe he would, you know, give me something to play with and to, to delve into so that my time could be consumed rather than with uh, minor crimes. Instead, <laughs> instead of a tire jack, he gave you a camera. <laughs> yes. He, he was a gentleman. Mm -hmm. If he was a gangster, I would have probably been, you know, headed towards prison, and I was anyhow. And you might have had a chainsaw if you lived on a farm. Could have been. Pops didn't have chainsaws in mind, but uh, <laughs> for sure. Um, now, I was a kid. It was West Hempstead, Long Island. Um, I was malformed as a, as a child, and I f the camera did give me some sense of comfort. I was photographing some team guys. I girls, this and that, it gave me a, a you know, a, 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 log a logis for, for my inquiry. Um, and the camera came in as a, I think the Super Icon to be was the first thing in my hand. Uh, and I won a contest, a Kodak contest for a hobbyist, and I won a Kodak Brownie. Um, f uh, that was my first Guggenheim. <laughs> of the two, that was the first. <laughs> that was, that was the th well, that would be my first. There would be two others to come, but that much later. Yeah. So if we fast forward, which I don't want to do, but for the purposes of our video, um, you ended up studying with probably one of the most cantankerous but best known, um, certainly well-respected in the field, Lizette Modell, who was um, doing the club scenes, doing the ballery, doing the swells, as they said, at some time, and also doing a lot of abstract work on the streets of New York. Mm -hmm. So I never really thought about it until I started to look at her work in the context that you studied with her, and I see a lot of 
her ideas in some ways, visual ideas in, in your work. Mm -hmm. Is that where it came from, or it was just something that you were called to? I think Lisette and I shared something together, and it's a calling of sorts, you know. It's a calling, first of all, to delve into personalities, not because they're curios or aberrant, but because by the fact of their shape, they had a certain sense of power. Lisette, like myself, never wanted to take some of these heavy set and what not kind of people and make fools out of them. She basically thought that they were courageous by living inside the shape of their bodies that way. And I accord with that, you know. Um, not that I dwelled with you know, heavy, heavier types, etc., but I, I dwelled at certain points with people who really knew how to express themselves, even with ennui and total f boring, boredom, I should say, are with, you know, cantankery and, you know, physical engagement in, in ways which are beyond the norm, to mm -hmm. say the least. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, if, if, if we look at one of your contemporaries, um, Diane Arbus, and your work that for a period of time paralleled, you were shooting at the same time she was, mm -hmm. um, similar venues in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, magazine stories, work that appeared in the newspaper. Um, but it's interesting to see where she, where she came to that fork in the road and you went to the left and she went to the right. That there was a, a big parting of the idea you were just talking about, about how she looked at people and documented, not out of path pathetic situations, but there was a sympathy to her work. But I think your, your work is a different kind of sympathy if there is such a thing where the idea of how you were photographing them was perfectly yours, and, and her idea was very different. And there were other photographers at the same time, and maybe you could talk about that generation of photographers that you were working with, others than Diane, I mean, Gary Winogrand, and you know, a number of other people who were on the streets at the same time you were, and, and basically in New York during the 60s and 70s. Um, and just what your interaction was or wasn't, and how you see your work fitting in or not fitting into to what was going on in terms of mainstream. Well, I have to say, first of all, just on a social level, I was not necessarily friendly with a lot of photographers. I didn't know Gary. In fact, when I did get to know him, I didn't like him at all. Whereas many just, you know, adored him, if not personally, but because of the ama amount, amazing amount of verve that he had for photographing. But also, I was of the deep left, and so when, when I was photographing, there was a political persuasion involved, which was um, thinking that there was some kind of revolution of sorts coming along, and thinking that when I did Social Graces, for instance, that you're talking about perhaps work before, but I was out there in Harlem teaching. I had started teaching in 1963, 64 and went on ever since, and, and uh, was up in Harlem, up in the Great Society, thing called Har You Act, photographed on the streets up there. But basically my work was not given towards just exploring photography, as was Diane's as well. Gary was more about what he was curious about, but the, photography was a big subject matter. I wasn't so interested in photography, I was interested in the, in the photograph as a tool for expressing something to do with the sensuality of curiosity or the, the um, politicality of the event, or some kind of mishmash marriage of those two elements. Mm -hmm. you know. A cause for the better? And definitely a cause for the better. I thought we, we were thinking about changing the world. I had no glib things to say like Gary did about, I photographed to see what things look like when they're photographed. Uh-uh, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I photographed because I wanted things to look like they felt to me. Mm -hmm. Which I think is, is maybe what sets your work apart in, in a long view, when we can look back in a retrospective view and then start to compare your work to your value of, of photographers who are also working. I think you can start to see the differences. And I think, you know, probably your work grew out of the Photo League more than any of the others. Um, the Photo League was a one-of-a-kind kind of institution, and it fostered that idea of, certainly the idea Cornell Kappa had of concerned photography. Mm -hmm. He just brought it into 
the next few decades of, mm -hmm. of how photographers were socially motivated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where your work fits in. I think a lot of people misunderstand it. So let's talk about that misunderstanding, that they look at your work as some kind of glitzy, want-to-be-at-the-party kind of <laughs> photograph, <laughs> which is, is not at all what it is. I don't, without the camera, I no want to be here. <laughs> I'm fine not to be at those parties. Right. My the, all the way up to being work working for Vanity Fair and photographing the Oscars and all kinds of other assorted you know glibberies, or hipperies or whatever kind of rees he got, um, was really just basically an extension of the, an investigation of power, and the powerful and the and the gilded the gilded ones you know, but not an investigation with any hostility involved. Even though I had political uh, uh, you know chops, or acuity. Um, I never was able to photograph from a polemic point of view because I'm just, just simply human. Mm -hmm. And it has to be said that my mother, communist as she was, was also wearing minks and driving around in the Stutz Bearcat, you know, and she was, as, as you would call it, a mink Marxist, you know. And she was, uh, she was uh, uh, abominated by the party, and she had to quit the party because of their rigidity and her sense of frivolity, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was drawn to both a moral stance and a historical stance, and yet at the same time I love to be enwrapped with furs. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting that your career, because of its longevity, and because of the success you've had, whether you would want to admit to it or not, but oh, certainly I can, I, can, <laughs> I can look at a number of photographers that I've known closely and, and known for a long period of time, but I can't think of really anybody who has really covered as many bases as you've covered. You're, you're almost a utility player on the best baseball team that existed, where you could sort of do a number of different things and adapt to situations, which not a lot of photographers can. They get into a groove. I don't want to say rut, but it's a groove. They they're feel very comfortable within a certain set of skin and they keep going at it, but you seem to challenge a lot of notions. I mean, if I look at your earlier work versus now, there's, there's, a de uh, there's a visual change, but I'm sure it's not the visual that you're after, it's the emotional. Exactly. There's a, con there's a continuity, which is I keep on going after uh, a sensual presence, a kind of, a, a, you know, an internal, um, an internal physical magnet the things that compel me. And, and that goes, for, you're talking about switching over from barrier to barrier, you know. I photographed praying mantises for three years, almost exclusively <laughs> had I not been working for a living as a photographer. And by the way, <laughs> um, I wouldn't have photographed anything but, except they, they do die in the winter after the third frost. Thank God. So you had a few months off. <laughs> I, had a, I, had my, I could go to Florida. No, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I had to take care of the goddamn farm. But, um, but nevertheless, so, and the praying mantises with their, you know, primal elegance and their, you know, un, astute, you know, acuity for catching their prey and their beauty, you know, just compelled me. And I, at certain points, when I would be down there on my knees, you know, looking at these critters, you know, empathy is part of, a big part of my presence, you know. So, like them, you now, I am you, you are me. Mm -hmm. I see you and what you look like. I must be looking just like you. A mantis is not outside the, the realm of that particular construct. I look at these skinny, angulated little critters with their menacing ways, I must be them. I am them. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably Buddhist, even though I'm not a Buddhist. You it know? could be. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's. I think there's a certain um, inquisitiveness, maybe. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's what really we've been talking around or talking directly about, mm -hmm. is that the camera helps you realize what you're curious about. And maybe not understand why you're curious, but it sort of saves that curiosity for when you've got the time to sit down for, unfortunately, at a computer now and look at your work. But when there was the days of the darkroom, for those people who don't remember a darkroom, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was, it's a, an endangered species in photography. Today it is, yeah. Um, it's amazing how many people have grown up just in the digital world and how quickly they've grown up in it and don't realize the craft 
the real hands-on, hands in the chemicals and the developer and the stop and the fix and the washers that went into photography, the craft of photography, which that's not what this interview is about, but you've been there and you has probably sent more time in the darkroom than anybody else or as much time as anybody else. That said, I've worked for a long, long time with assistants, but I've when we were working in silver and, and, um, and working within the darkroom with them, but a lot of the printing had been done by others under my supervision, but I I probably spent 25 years in the darkroom yeah. out of the 50, yeah. Which is, you know, gets back to the teaching. To be able to speak from that experience um, mm -hmm. is almost difficult to some extent because you're talking to students who don't know of a darkroom, and if they did, they'd probably be running in the opposite direction. Many of them, but I teach at Bard College, and it's a good college, and it yeah. has a very, very um, curious population of students a very good program, and also we insist on them working in silver, and the kids are into it. And I have to say that my freshman class, which I teach, you know, every Monday, um, uh, got their chops together. They printed well, and they were they were thrilled by it. So all the while they had been doing work in digital beforehand, but when they came to the silver process, they were they were they were cool, you yeah. know. And the point is, is that you can't really understand how to print on the computer within digital terms unless you've had silver experience. Mm -hmm. But that brings us to a good point and a way to maybe close out the interview by talking about, we talked about the changes of photography. We talked about how you approach photography, that it's, it's from the gut, from the heart, and not anything else, that you're looking at subjects that interest you and you photograph them for that reason. So let's talk about the market of photography, the, the market that didn't exist when you were not only first photographing, but it really didn't exist till the late 70s, let's be honest. There was a handful of galleries. There were a handful of museums that were actively collecting and showing photographs. Um, there were no private dealers because there was no trade to there make was no money to There be was made. no money to be made. So now we're in... 2013, we have lots of galleries. We have books devoted to just what galleries are doing every month or every two months. We have fairs in New York and Paris and Los Angeles. And there you are, looking back on your career and wishing or not wishing that you were more a part of it than you are or you're too much a part of it. Which is it? <laughs> I'm just simply a part of it. However you, you know... Um uh, however you perform your duty on the map of, of existence is how you actually either chose or were destined to. Mm -hmm. And I've always been, um, reasonably speaking, an outsider. So I'm not, even though I'm very, very akin to understanding the nature of market, because I work over the years, on the, uh, let's, let's go way back. In 1967, I curated a show for the peace movement at Columbia University called The People Protest. And it was basically, I had edited all the pictures because we, the peace movement, the saying or whatever it was, brought together thou, oh, hundreds of people who I, we were asking them to go photograph one or another of the peace marches of that time. And I had this multi-thousands of things to look through. And I made a show which was Eisenstinian in its continuity and stuff like that. But then to kind of put it more on the map of the of the experts. I invited Bruce Davidson and Diane Arbus and and uh, um, all of the folks of the of the time, you know. Mm -hmm. In terms of market, so we were selling Diane's picture because things were for sale for sixty five dollars. The bomb Hanoi with the pork pie hat and mm -hmm. another one like that. And Bruce's pictures were fifteen or twenty seven. I'm not sure, you know. Ralph Gibson, who put in a, a picture or two of a symbolic order, you know, was uh, 35. There was some hot marketeering out going on then. <laughs> yeah, if we only knew. <laughs> if we only knew. <laughs> so then, you know, Peter McGill, who just now is endorsing a stock stockbroking company in uh, Art in America, uh, was a college student, you know, way after that, coming into school, you know, gawkishly photographing pushpins, saying that they were insur insurmountable evidence of the greatness of photography. Um, <laughs> at any rate, the market is now not only in photography, but in art, 
and generally speaking, a place where you can make a lot of money and indulge in some of the most massive, flagrant um, uh, personification of vulgarity that you can possibly imagine. I can have a story about Larry Gagosian. He was talking to Abby Rosen one day. I was photographing them. And Abby, who is a tasteful guy, said about a painting that Larry wanted him to buy, he said, but Larry, there's too much red. The balance isn't correct in the painting. The aesthetic is incorrect. There's too much red on this side. And Gagosian said to Mr. Rosen, but Abby, it'll turn black by next year. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's maybe the fear of people buying photographs, too, is that, you know, photographs have this mystery. Um, there's a lot of chemi chemistry, chemicals, and process to making a photograph. And I think that in the auction world is still, there are questions, you know, and more so questions about authenticity. When was the print really made? Um, the V word is thrown around like it's nothing, a vintage print. I know. I mean, I didn't hear that till there were, you know... The galleries like Harry Lund and a number of people who really started the, the field that used that word, which I always thought was for wine. I didn't realize it <laughs> applied to photographs. And, but it's, it's stuck. And it's stuck because the galleries and the dealers promoted it. And, and nobody um, or everybody who knows me knows I really don't use that word. I mean, I was brought up in a print and drawing field where it was a first state print or a second state print, and it identified it more particularly to when, especially when you're talking about Durer or, or the Rembrandt prints, the etchings that were made every several hundred years. I mean, it would be a first state print or a second state. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and even though photography came out of the museum print and drawing world, I mean, that's where museums started to put their photographs mm -hmm. in a back closet behind a print and drawing department, mm -hmm. you know, or part of a graphics collection because they didn't know how else to classify it. Mm -hmm. um, it really, I would have thought, would have grown up with that akin, that kinship mm -hmm. to prints and drawings, but it didn't. It, mm -hmm. it got swept off its feet into a very commercial direction. And mm -hmm. it, was a, it was maybe one of the most brilliant marketing tools ever created by a very small number of people and it's stuck. It's stuck, and it's stuck, and it's blasphemy also, because the thing is, is that when you first originally make the picture, and then you make the original print, it's usually substandard, uh, because you don't understand the nature of the picture, because you haven't seen it long enough, and mm -hmm. so basically it's too much, you know, connected to the, the heart of the matter and the immediacy of you experiencing the experience, connected to maybe being impatient in the darkroom just to see it, so you sort of crank it out, no, not crank it, but push it out in a fast kind of way, and and if, unless you're very, very fastidious and compulsive, you go on with it, you know, and there it goes. And uh, I know, for instance, you know, that, that works that we do even now on ink or, in, or a little bit earlier in silver, the, the later prints are always the better ones. So the vintage, as a kind of, an, of, a, of a, the notion of, 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 a, of fiscal quality, mm -hmm. is completely erroneous. Yeah. It, it's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. That's a big word. Yeah. But um, <clears> or <throat> you take Robert Frank, early, early prints. Robert had no particular concern for technique. No. Not at all. Man, he wanted to be on the road. He wanted to snort some coke, smoke some weed, carry on with stuff. You know, wear his t-shirts. You know, um, he, all of those things. You know, with coffee stains and whatnot like that, sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the one which are now produced, you know, for him, perhaps if they are you know, are, are less so, which is absurd. They're all much more beautiful and much more understood, much more articulated. Yeah. And... Well, I remember Andreas Feinecker once said to me that, you know, the prints he was doing in the late 20s and 30s, <coughs> in, before he ever came to this country in Germany and in, in France, before he came to the U.S., um, he once said to me, he said, if I could redo all of my work in contemporary paper, I would do it. Because he said, I love the contrast. I love the bright white. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get bright whites. Back then. You couldn't get it because they that didn't put fluorescence in the paper. So yeah. when you look back at your early work that you maybe didn't understand when you were doing it, mm -hmm. you understand it better now. You, you understand do. it in a context of life.
Yeah. Not the context of, oh, I'm a better photographer. It's a context that you're a better person or you understand <laughs> your ideas more. At least they're more, uh, you know, a more... I mean, it doesn't mean we agree with your ideas, but you, no. you understand them more, yeah. you know. And I think that's, that's an important development. And it shows that you, you know, the word artist can be thrown around very easily, but I think in a lot of ways that's what makes you critical. In, in terms of your observation of the field over that period of time, the work physically you've contributed and created, and, and your ability is, is as a teacher and a mentor. I mean, that's giving back. I mean, that's maybe the ultimate kind of reward for being a photographer is that you're, you're passing on a knowledge to another generation. And that's probably going to make you feel very good. I... It's the best of all things, teaching. I mean, photographing and making beautiful photographs and having a gift originally and being able to act, to, act to, uh, to reach for that gift and, and have it be given back to me, not each and every time, certainly not, but every so often a picture comes along which is like half a miracle, you know, um, that's a huge, 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 huge pleasure. But it is, in a way, a kind of a happenstance of luck. Because I was given the gift, I didn't, uh, you know, buy it. I didn't uh, um, hoggle for it. I didn't knife anybody's back to get it. It just came along. It was mine, and I was able through my the, the work of my early, of my parents when I was an early kid, and through my own drive and whatnot like that, able to, to keep on moving on it. You know, it's a wonderful life. But more wonderful than that life is the life of giving back to others. You know, and being able to. Teach to the child, if you will. And then when I started teaching, they weren't children; they were um, comrades mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. or something. But um, but now you teach rather than teach to the to the to the subject of photography, which of course obviously is central to the expressive tools for the psyche, the soul, the eyes of that young person. But you teach to the child, meaning you ask them to do things which will which will allow them to give to you some indication of what it is that they must do. Mm -hmm. Some kind of origin of something which is impassioned within them that, that makes up the corpus of their curiosity. And then to try to emphasize that so that when they come to the idea of in our, the original thing that they're going to produce, that it actually comes from an origin within themselves rather than from a group of ideas, opportunistic ideas, which are slated to be original. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So take what you've just said, and let's just take it to the end of this interview by asking you to, to say, if you could, if there is a way to say it, what makes a great photographer? Because you've just given us the kernels and the seeds of how somebody would start. So what brings them to that level where their work is on exhibition, like yours has been. Their work is published, like yours has been. Their work is awarded, like yours has been. Their work appears in magazines, like yours has, work, has been. So you're, in a sense, professing a success without saying it, but you're telling your students. You're giving them, in a sense, half the Rosetta Stone, <laughs> right? I mean, you're, you're giving them this, the seeds. So where, where's the links? Where, where, how do you connect all of that as a conclusion? As a successful photographer yourself, without thinking about why you're successful, but if somebody were to come to you now and say, well, you know, what are the elements other than what you've just said? I think uh, you would probably want to sum it up by saying it's hard driving in the middle of the luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. I think so much of what we know about successful artists, the right place at the right time, they had a picture that somebody flipped over and told their friends, a gallerist saw it, it was in a show and somebody bought it and somehow it made itself to auction and somebody else loved it enough to buy it. And as they say, the rest is history. Right. That was great.